Um, as is is the Yuan Hao in the participant list here? Yes. 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 Could 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 you could you hear me? Um. Can you share the screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, can you uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see oh, and, okay. and hear you clearly. Okay. Okay. Mm, may I start it? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Yuan Hao Liu from East China Normal University. I'm pleased to present our paper on efficient adversarial sequences generation for RN with symbolic weighted finite automata. And this is our, our outline divided into six parts. First of all, we are building an efficient adversarial sequence generation approach for and the adversarial sequences are more convert generated by our approach. Finally, experimental results show that our approach outperforms the state-of-art attack method. The following part is background. Robustness of DN is a focus of the recovery research. It can be branched into two parts, adversarial attacks and interpretable models and black balls and white balls attacks are important components of the uh, uh, adversary attacks such as FGSM, PGD, Newton 4, and et cetera. But exceeding attack methods above are not applicable for our Interpretable models can take many forms such as DFA, PFA, WFA, SWFA. In summary, we choose SWFA to deal with the problem to craft adversarial examples. Uh, sorry, Cynthia, I think that we have some technical problems there. Yeah, I can see. Okay, yeah, you're, you're, you're back. Can you okay, try okay. sharing your screen again? Sorry, sorry, sorry for my, for my ne ne network. Okay. No uh, okay, okay. Uh, we, we, we proposed efficient adversarial sequence generation for RN. It can be represented as a six table and SWFA is an invariant of WFA we extracted from the original RN to enhance the interpretability of RN and prepare for subsequent adversarial sequence generation. Afterwards, let me introduce some details of SWFA. Transition edge of an SWFA are labeled by functions from the alphabet to a summary instead of predicates. And SWFA enhances the abstraction ability of WFA and can deal with a possibility infinite alphabet efficiently. So we take full advantage of SWFA's symbolic feature to preserve its symbolic input. And to the best of our knowledge, our approach is the first one to abstract iron into SWFA for perturbation. Okay, now I will explain our technical roadmap for its paper. Our model has two main parts. The first is symbolic weighted finite automata extraction. We extract SWFA from the trinit RN, which is a crucial part of the approach which constructs the symbolic. Then the second part is adversarial sequence generation by SWFA. We perturb the symbolic input to get symbolic sequences and use SWFA 
to reduce the complex. We formally analyze the reachability of SWFA to accelerate the generation process and then check whether the newly generated rapidly symbolic sequence is an adversary one. If the sequence is judged, can collect con concrete ones from symbolic ones by sampling techniques. Then I will introduce the critical part of the SWFA extraction. To be specific on the step, well, firstly, we calculate the T input to guide the symbolic input abstraction and control the range of perturbation, followed by executing the original RN model to extract the hidden states. Next, by applying the fast KCB twice, we acquire uh, the abstract states in the set of hidden states extracted and do the symbolic alphabet in a set of input tokens. Then, after building the transition matrices to record the mapping between spec specified and input token and state transition and representing initial and the final states as the expected format, can shape the WFA. Finally, through guard function learning, uh, WFA can be converted into SWFA. In summary, we improve the efficiency as well as extending it for infinite reality inputs and there's some normal process like the getting the calculation of half permit input and the sampling for the symbolic establishment to build SWFA in an efficient and, uh, and, and scalable way. The process of WFA extraction is based on the framework proposed in Do et al. 2019, where we upgrade the KDCP to the fast KDCP algorithm, and the, the, this is our concrete algorithm. Okay, now I'll try to elaborate technically on our adversary sequence generation. For that, uh, es essentially, our model has four significant steps. First, we set an appro appropriate T input to get the symbolic input. Second, our abstract input space is divided into symbolic blocks. In detail, the input is abstract in, into several regions by fast KDCP, and the regions can be composed of rectangles, cubes, or half cubes, according to K. Assuming the input is normalized into an interval zero to one, we equally divide the input into T parts. As shown in the bottom left, they are three by three by three symbolic blocks where K and T equals three. Third, we find perturbation, direction, and perturb the symbolic input. We will iteratively increase perturbation to search for symbolic adversary sequences and intentionate them to concrete adversary sequences by sampling techniques, such as random sampling. Fourth and last, we check triple zero status as shown in the formula on the middle below. Representing the input exceeds the generalization limit of our model and finally screen now the adversary example. And this is our concrete algorithm. Well, then let me introduce our experiment. We use three data sets, NGSIM and the other one UCR time series data sets. And then autonomous driving data sets generated by Kara. In the first experiment, we implement the SWFA extraction algorithm on five different time series datasets and use the five indicators here to evaluate them. Based on the results, we can draw the following conclusion below. The accuracy and the running time are similar with uh, the original RN. And then in, in the second experiment, we compare our adversarial sequence generation approach, ABSG with several baseline methods in the aspect of attack success rate and time cost at different perturbation intensities on autonomous driving data set. Our approach has an outstanding <laughs> success rate, which respectively has 81.1 uh, recurring percent, 94.56 percent, and 112.92 percent improvement compared with Newton 4, and our approach is 1.4 recurring times faster then Newton for at most with the same perturbation and an even higher level of ASR. In the picture, the vehicle's stretch three points with four different colors constitute adversarial sequences generated by algorithm is in table two. You will find that the adversarial stretch three generated by our approach 
as lower perturbation that is harder for people to recognize, while the trajectory point generated by other algorithms are not in line with the characteristics of standard vehicle trajectories. This real world example strongly reflects or that or algorithm can achieve higher ASR on the, the small perturbation. Next, compared with other adversary attack algorithms, our algorithm is more efficient in generating adversarial sequences and with more subtle perturbations. And compared with other abstract algorithms, we take advantage of the real value of operation ability of WFA to simulate RN. Further, we use the symbolic characteristics of SWFA to deal with the infinite possibility of int input, which enhances generalization. In conclusion, I would like to review our work. Our significant contributions are the following two points propose the novel fast KDCP symbolic extraction algorithm and uh, efficient adversarial sequence generation approach for RN by SWFA. Last but not least, we also declare our advantages in the following three points applicable to generate convert adversarial sequences, keep the perturbation within the humane visible range and suitable with the special temporal sequential tasks. And then for our future work, we, will, we still have something to be improved, such as adapt, uh, adapting to large class sequential data and studying on various data sets. And we will optimize our approach and explore more details of SWFA. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop me an email. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your presentation, Yanha. Um, okay. Um, if, if anyone has the question from um, the audience, feel free to text in the chat or leave it for the panel discussion later. So do we have authors from the second paper, study on mitigating hard boundaries of decision tree based uncertainty estimates? Yes. Just um, by the way, do you mind uh, stop sharing? Okay, okay. Um, just one question. Can you see my screen? The slide set? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, just one second. Okay, um, so hello, my name is Pascal Gerber and I'm a safety engineer working at Fraunhofer AEC. And in this presentation, I will give a short overview of a study on mitigating hard boundaries of decision tree based uncertainty estimates for AI models. It's a study on which colleagues from the field of data science and I have worked together. To start with the motivation, so the outcomes of data driven models in short DDMs cannot be assumed to be always correct. So the outcomes are considered to be subject to uncertainty and therefore also different approaches like inside model or outside model exist to provide uncertainty estimates. So estimates that express a likelihood that a model's outcome could be incorrect. An example for the outside model approach is the concept of the model agnostic uncertainty wrappers. And in the pedestrian use case, which is depicted below in the slide here, the application of such a wrapper is depicted in a condensed form. Here, a YOLO v3 based data driven model is applied to detect pedestrians on camera images taken from a driving car. And to enrich the data driven model with a dependable uncertainty estimate for a predefined confidence level, the uncertainty wrapper considers several influence factors in addition to the DDM's input. So, in addition to this camera image, which we see on the left side. These influence factors could be, for instance, be related to the present weather condition or the distance between the camera and the pedestrians, which should be detected. Yeah, to obtain interpretable uncertainty estimates, the uncertainty wrapper relies on a decision tree approach. And this decision tree is used to cluster inputs with similar uncertainties based on influence factors like, in the use case before, could be the weather conditions or the distance. And um, yeah, the key benefit of, this, of these decision trees in this context is the interpretability of the uncertainty estimates. And to showcase this interpretability, 
we can consider an example data point with a feature with feature values for the distance of 11.45 meters and the semantic visibility of 0.3. And by evaluating the branching criterion in the nodes of this decision tree, which is depicted here, we can also, as indicated, easily understand which features and which feature values lead to a specific uncertainty estimate. So in this example, the data point is, for example, assigned to a leaf that has an uncertainty of like 16%. Um, and therefore, also this data point um, yeah, is expected yeah, um, to have this uncertainty. Um, however, there's also one problem with these decision trees because they rely on hard decision boundaries as a split criterion. And for continuous feature values, this can lead to uncertainty estimates that are less intuitive. For example, if we look at the previous data point x1 from the previous slide and increase its um, continuous distance value slightly um, to obtain x2, we can see that the uncertainty estimate for x2 is now derived based on another leaf in this tree and is much larger with a value of uh, 40, 43%. In the given case, it would be intuitive that the uncertainty of detecting a pedestrian, of course, increases with increasing distance. But um, however, a small variation, like in this example here, should not have such a big influence. So the uncertainty should not um, increase that drastically. Yeah, to address this problem, we tried to identify suitable alternative approaches to the decision trees. And for this, we first of all defined some goals and conducted a search. Um, so the first goal was that the approaches should satisfy um, the main goal of mitigating hard decision boundaries to soften the uncertainty estimates. Secondly, the approaches should allow for interpretable uncertainty estimates, so comparable to the situation in the decision trees. However, also the runtime complexity should not increase excessively to allow for uncertainty estimates within an acceptable time span. These uh, three goals we took into consideration directly by searching for alternative approaches. And additionally, we set a further goal to ensure that the performance of the uncertainty estimates would not decrease significantly compared to the decision trees. But um, this goal was assessed by means of a later evaluation. In total, we selected five approaches, which we have listed here. So one of them is random forests. There are also two fuzzy approaches and two soft decision tree approaches. The essential concept of these approaches is mainly that an uncertainty estimate is not only identified on the basis of one leaf, as in the case of the decision tree approach, but um, here it's the case that um, yeah, it is now featuring um, an American membership decree to possible multiple leaves. So instead of only one leaf, we are considering here multiple leaves, and um, yeah, hence also several leaf uncertainties are weighted when providing an uncertainty estimate for a data point. The key difference between the approaches, so between the new approaches, is the type of membership function they rely on. And in a simplified um, example of the fuzzy decision tree, which is depicted below, we can see how memberships are calculated. So here, each node in the tree has a membership function that defines the memberships of a data point to its child nodes based on a data point's feature. In the indicated case of the root nodes, this is based, for example, um, yeah, based on the distance feature. And by considering the leaf uncertainties in combination with the weights that are again derived based on the membership values, the final uncertainty estimate can, can be calculated as indicated on the bottom. Yeah, in order to evaluate also goal four, the uncertainty estimation performance, we created data sets for the use case of pedestrian detection. For this, we used the Kala simulator to record images from pedestrians. Um, yeah, yeah, for pedestrians from a driving car, along with other features that are relevant to the uncertainty wrapper, such as the current weather conditions and, for example, the distance between the car and the pedestrians. Then we applied YOLO v3 as a data driven model to detect pedestrians. And then later on, we determined the correctness of um, YOLO V3's outcome. So in essence, whether an existing pedestrian was detected or whether it was not detected. Finally, we then built and calibrated uncertainty wrapper instances 
that were based on different um, softening approaches and evaluated the uncertainty estimates by means of the prior score and also um, yeah, by means of the subcomponents of the prior score, um, which we used here as a metric. So um, to come to the results, um, what we saw is that the random forests closely followed by decision trees showed the best results considering the overall uncertainty estimation performance. The two fuzzy approaches, as well as the two soft decision tree approaches, they showed excellent performance in softening the um, decision boundaries, but they achieved the reduced uncertainty estimation performance. Um, in terms of the prior score, the approaches show higher resolution values compared to the decision tree. So um, this means that they can give more case-specific um, yeah, uncertainty estimates, um, but this is at the cost of the reliability value and the approaches they tend to provide to overconfident uncertainty estimates in some cases. Um, finally, all investigated softening approaches showed a lower but still acceptable level of interpretability and runtime performance compared to decision trees, which were um, here our baseline. Yeah, to come to the conclusion, so the results, um, they do not allow providing a general recommendation for the use of a particular approach. It's rather the case that the selection of an approach has um, proved to be a trade-off decision, which should be made considering the planned application of the uncertainty wrapper. Um, so based on the study results, we see, we see two main directions for further work. Um, the first one is that we could um, yeah, work on specific recommendations that could be developed to guide practitioners um, in choosing an approach for a concrete setting. And the second one is um, yeah, that we, the investigated approaches could be further modified to address the observed limitations regarding the uncertainty estimation performance. Yeah, and um, with this, I want to end my presentation. Thank you so much, Pascal. Um, do we have author from the next paper? Uh, yes. I'm here, so I'm going to share my screen now. Yeah, sure. Please go ahead. So hi everyone, thank you for joining my presentation today. And I'm Aman Sharif and I'm going to present uh, our work quantifying the importance of latent feature in your swap. So can you see my screen? Yes, we can see okay. it clearly. So I will start with an overview of the current neural network challenging issues uh, from the testing perspective. So deep neural network um, learned the decision rule through training on a large data set by gradually optimizing their parameters until they achieve the required accuracy. Therefore, deep neural network doesn't have control, uh, specific controls, control flow structure, which make it difficult um, to precisely define a specific um, testing criteria. And also most of the testing techniques are robust structure coverage, for example, um, like a neural activation coverage, and tend uh, to transform directly, um, and, and tend to directly add altering the input space, for example, the image pixel, and that have proved to be less effective in validating, um, in validating the safety behavior of the intelligent systems. Especially that uh, recent studies emphasized that the factor ca causing the adversarial vulnerability is the distortion in the latent feature space. So we need to explore the interior logic of the learning models like, to increase their robustness and um, to ensure their safety. So the intention of this work is to understand the, the deep neural network understanding the decision process by analyzing the latent feature learned by the model and after that generate additional test cases based on that. So this presentation is concentrated on the analysis step. 
So the key, the key contribution is to propose a method that estimates the importance of the neural network latent feature by analyzing an associated Bayesian network sensitivity to distribution shift. So I will, I will um, start with a, uh, with a brief description of the Bayesian network abstraction model that we utilize to do the analysis. And after that, I will introduce the sensitivity analysis of the latent feature. So the Bayesian network abstraction model is a dimensionality reduction technique using feature extraction algorithm to abstract the behavior of a deep neural network. So to construct the Bayesian network, we first extract the hidden features that have been layered by the neural network layers uh, using feature extraction technique, uh, for example, principal component analysis. And, um, and associate each feature with a node of a, a Bayesian network. And since this extracted feature uh, range over a continuous space, we discharacterize each feature into finite sets of interfaces. For example, in this uh, picture, um, we discharacterize, discharacterize each feature into two interfaces. And after that, we associate each feature with a, a probability tables. So now let's uh, go to the heart of, the, of our work. So Bayesian network based Latin feature analysis. So in this uh, analysis, we leverage the Bayesian network model that we discussed uh, previously to estimate the sensitivity of an individual feature to a control distribution shape. So to do the analysis, we first calculate uh, a probability for input sample belong belonging to the Bayesian network distribution. And after that, we, we, perform vertebra we perform the vertebration on each features. And in the final step, uh, to, to identify the, um, the impact of the vertebration, we compute the distance between the original probability factor. Uh, I forget to say here, and after vertebration, vertebrate each feature, we recalculate uh, their uh, probabilities uh, belonging to the Bayesian network. So we compute the distance between the original probability factor and the probability factor obtained from the vertebrate feature. Actually, this comparison allows us to, to observe the impact, uh, the implicit change uh, on the deep uh, model's uh, distribution. And this, we can, uh, this um, his reduction, its reduction. So here is an illustrative uh, diagram of the analysis uh, method that to compute the sensitivity of the extracted feature. So here we have the input sample. And first step, we perform the discretization step to obtain the, um, the feature interval, the associated feature interval. And here we have the Bayesian network um, and a, a distance matrix, dif different distance matrix. So uh, we conduct the internal and internal uh, analysis here by computing um, the probability of the uh, each sample belonging to the Bayesian network. And after that, we iterate uh, over each la uh, latent feature and uh, um, randomly uh, shifting it its interval to produce the modified um, feature um, interval uh, to, to produce the modified Fx. And after that, we recompute its probability under the Bayesian network. And now we have two probability of factors. So we compute the distance between this factor to, to get the distance for each um, considered feature. So for example, here is the result uh, of the of different distances. For example, here is the vertebrate feature, a six vertebrate feature here, and here is different distance. Uh, for uh, different uh, di different distance measures, uh, for example, L different L infinity norms, correlation, cosine, mean square error, and so on. So, in the first experiment, um, we introduced the feature importance. So, here is the result of the computed distance uh, for six uh, six uh, latent feature uh, performed on the MNIST model. So we associate each feature with a weight based on the measured sensitivity distance. So higher distribution change mean higher importance score. For example, assume we choose um, um, 
the correlation distance um, to determine uh, the feature importance score. So we use this equation to assign each, um, each feature uh, a weight value. In the second experiment, we performed the sensitivity analysis uh, to detect the adversarial di distribution and shape. So we want to examine if our um, technique can detect the, the adversarial distribution and shift. So to carry, up the, to carry up the experiment, we selected uh, six different uh, adversarial attack. Uh, and for each type of attack, we generate adversarial data set, uh, X attack from validation data set. And after that, we calculate the distance between their probability factors. So here is the chart. Uh, this chart um, show our result for three selected distance, which is L2 cosine and anti-fed divergence uh, on the MNS data set, MNS model and MNS data set. And here in each column, we have a different type of attack for each column. And in the horizontal axis here, we have the feature extracting technique, which is we use two linear uh, technique a principal component analysis and um, independent component analysis and one nonlinear technique here. So in the, in the vertical axis, we can um, see uh, the calculated distance between the, uh, between the probability factor for X uh, test and probability factors, uh, probability distribution of X attack. Uh, so we can we can see um, that every distance shown allow us to measure uh, the a shift in the input distribution for every attack except uh, for the CW attack. So and this is it's interesting um, observation uh, that like encourage us to to conduct more experiment on this specific type of attack. So the experiment results show, show that computing distance between two Bayesian network probability distribution clean and perturbed by interface shift or adversarial attack can detect the distribution shift and can reveal about uh, important features. So uh, the result, um, this is uh, the research uh, investigate how the distribution of feature in the latent space change in the present of distortion, and also propose a technique to measure importance value of a high level feature that indicate the role of the corresponding feature in the underlying decision process. So finally, just to mention the future work uh, about the, how we can use this feature uh, weights. So first we can use the importance feature tower visual, visualization, and also we can use it to design a high level testing metric that evaluate the, the robustness of the deep uh, neural network. And third, we can also use it our uh, training process. So thank you. That's all for today. Thanks, Emily. Do we have authors from the final paper of this session? Uh, hi, Cynthia. I hope you can hear me. Hi. Yes, I can hear you. Can you try sharing the screen? Yeah, so I hope you can see my screen. Yes. OK, so then I will start. Uh, thank you, Cynthia. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Deepul Nair. And uh, today, I will be talking about uh, robustness of uncertainty estimation. Uh, and specifically to label outliers. So here is a problem uh, we would like to share. We want to uh, put a deep neural network in, a, uh, deploy a deep neural network on an autonomous system here in the case of a robotic arm. Um, so what happens is in order to do such a task, we want to improve all of our dependability attributes and including safety in it, uh, right? So, and for improving dependability, uh, one of the methodology which has been proposed in the literature, which is helping in improving or building cases is uncertainty estimation. So uncertainty estimation is a task where the network uh, not only predicts its output, but also predicts uh, the uncertainty estimated with it. So this work is uh, 
different with the one which we had shown uh, by Pascal, which is this is the internal the uncertainty estimation and uh, the more of uh, the work. So in here, uh, the uncertainty estimation is a more difficult task because it is, uh, you know, for the supervised learning, it has the labels to learn the output. And there is no labels or true labels in uncertainty and this the network has to learn on its own. And it's a very important task uh, for assurance building also used as even being used as a metric in assurance building. It's also uh, been used for an you know, adversarial attack and things. So it is getting important in safety cases to have uncertainty estimation of the network. So since it's so important, we looked into the robustness of it. And uh, what we particularly look what happens when the labels on which it is learned contains outliers. So what is the, how does the uncertainty estimation score when, the, the, so in this work, we will talk about, uh, uh, explore the robustness of uncertainty estimation and specifically to the presence of label outliers. Uh, we would uh, show and demonstrate how current uncertainty estimations are not robust to label outliers. And uh, finally, we propose a loss function which is able to learn the answer in the presence of outliers. So, oh, so current all uncertainty estimation methods are learned using clean data sets, uh, which basically, and this in specific situations like robotics and real world systems is not a, a luxury to have. Uh, let's say the task here is a monocular depth estimation where the deep neural network has to predict given an RGB image the depth, depth uh, and you can see uh, that uh, the, the depths which are available here, uh, the data set contains this sensor noise, which uh, is because of the, 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 the sensor being used in here. So such situations can come and then how does it, uh, so I will use this toy problem to uh, motivate and show the, the, the work. So here is a regression problem where we would like to regress from X to Y, and in the process also learn the uncertainties with it. So one of the most common method is the Gaussian negative log likelihood loss, where the output is modeled as a Gaussian distribution. And as you can see, the, the blue line is able to match with the, uh, the original line and the gray region is the uncertainty predicted by the neural network. And uh, you can see the losses have also been reduced to zero. So this is good, uh, but what happens when we add this uh, outliers in the in the training data? So now let's train it with the same one. And as you can see now, uh, not only that the model is not able to fit, the, the outliers drag the uncertainties over the whole region. And you can see it in the right plot that this is because of these three outliers, which is pulling the loss functions uh, up. So not only this is observed in uh, the Gaussian uh, thing, it's also the same observation with current state of the art uncertainty estimation like dropout from Gallen Germany or ensemble method from Lakshmi Narayan or the current state of the art, which is the evidential deep learning by 2020. So how do we solve uh, this issue where in the presence of outliers, can we learn uh, the correct uncertainty estimates. So here we borrow from classical statistics and use what we call the use of heavy tail distribution for modeling outliers. And the, the, uh, what we use is a common assumption that currently the output is modeled as a Gaussian distribution. So we can replace uh, the output with something called a heavy tail distribution. And in our case, we use the Laplace distribution. So the use of heavy tail uh, what it does is it helps in justifying for a network that when there are outliers, it can still justify the outliers without shifting its mean or the uncertainty, uh, minimum shift in its mean. So, um, so we need a loss function. So the loss function is taken as a negative log likelihood of the Dauchy distribution and that, so in our case, we will take the negative log likelihood of the Laplace distribution. So how does this look? Uh, so here is a Laplace distribution at mean value zero and the scale at 0.5 and the corresponding loss function, the negative log likelihood. And you can see the similarity of the Elven loss function. 
uh, it's but it's more uh, expressive than the loss function because at different values at the uh, at the scale different uncertainty values you can see the different uh, the different uh, loss functions and as you can see the as the uncertainty reduces in the uh, in the laplace function the gradient of the loss function uh, reduces and also the minimum also is uh, high now this uh, as the gradient saturates for higher uncertainties this helps in uh, reducing the effect of outliers while training so there are some other features of this uh, good features of this uh, one that this loss function is monotonic so it reduces uh, with all its inputs so this is helpful for learning the parameters it is smooth and finally it is has this bounded first and second derivative so this helps uh, in you know, in the exploding gradient problems so uh, how do now let's look into our toy problem how does that perform when we change the loss function from to the laplace distribution and you can see that currently the uncertainty estimates is uh, able to uh, the fit is better and the uncertainty estimate also is uh, having uh, better interpretable results. So we look into a toy problem now. How does this fare up to higher dimensional problems, right? So we replaced. Uh, uh, so so we looked into the problem of higher dimensional monopolar depth estimation. Uh, in this, the most popular data set is the New York uh, depth V2 data set. The good thing about, uh, as you know, the depth estimation task is given an RGB image. You have to predict the depth. And the good thing about this is because it has this sensor noise data. Also, there is a way of cleaning this data set. So they are able to get the clean data set. So for our problems, we will be training with the, uh, uh, the outlier data set. And then we will be testing with the clean data set. So the architecture we used was the unit. And uh, we also have two uncertainty metrics, which is because this is about measuring not the performance of the model, but more of the uncertainty. We're using the scoring, proper scoring rules uh, of interval score and entropy. Uh, and uh, both metrics should be minimum for a comparison. So here, we, what we did was a comparison between clean versus outlier label. So first, we train the model with clean data set since we have it. And you can see all the, and we compared the three uh, methods, evidential, Gaussian, and Laplace uncertainty estimation. And you can see all have comparable results in the performance of the uh, model and interval score, which is the performance of their uncertainty. Also, it's comparable just uh, for Gaussian method. So next, we train it with outliers and you can see the orange uh, bar plot and you can see how the models, the uncertainty and the uh, performance have shifted for evidential and Gaussian. And the shift is minimum in Laplace distribution uh, and important is the interval score because that's what we're measuring, how good is the uncertainty estimate. And also there you can see that the shift is a minimum for Laplace in its performance. So clearly it's saying that uh, training on a clean data set or on a outlier data set, Laplace uh, loss function is able to uh, perform. The next is uh, we looked into what is called as the use case of uncertainty. So one of the major use case of out, uh, uh, uncertainty estimate is the out of distribution detection. So let's suppose we are training on a particular distribution. We want that when the when it's deployed uh, in a real world and it sees some distribution it has not trained, it should have a high epistemic uncertainty. And it should say that I have not been trained. So please, uh, it is not safe to deploy in here. And uh, here we use the NYU, which uh, is the in distribution and the Apollo skips as an out of distribution. So the expected output is that the in distribution and out distribution uncertainty should be lying separate from each other. And here we use it with a bar plot to show that the blue is the in distribution and uncertainties and the orange is the uh, uh, out of distribution and you can see for both uh, evidential and Gaussian this is overlapping but uh, for Gaussian for Laplace uh, it is separate uh, and which claim which you can make a claim that we can set a threshold to say when a model is safe or not safe. We also did other ablation studies uh, which you can look in your uh, paper for adversarial detection and confidence measures. To conclude uh, now we Prove that many of the uncertainty estimation methods are not proposed to outliers and to improve, we are using a heavy tail based distribution loss function. 
and it's when applied, uh, we were able to get better estimate of the uncertainties, even in the presence of outliers. And we hope that this proposed loss function will be benefit in building software of uh, better safe software uh, where uncertainty is used as a metric uh, in the uh, finally, the code for the PyTorch implementation is available online, and I thank you for it. Thank you so much, Devo. Um, so now we'll head on to the Q&A session, panel discussion. Um, please raise your questions if you have any regarding the, the four papers we just presented, and also for our invited speaker. Feel free to jump in anytime. So if nobody asks, so I can probably start with uh, with my question. So my question was basically to Roy. So um, when you are talking about the um, safety, basically as a control problem, right? And uh, if we let uh, okay, so now um, for safety, what we need is a, a set of constraints. But then this probably is uh, slightly different with what uh, machine learning people is doing, right? So probably because I mean constraint, you can only have a a small set of constraints, so you cannot actually enumerate all possible constraints. And then uh, machine learning comes with a lot of data. And I'm just wondering what's your opinion of actually how to balance between these two different views. So uh, for machine learning's point of view, we like to have more and more data, and uh, we do not have to have a constraint. But then uh, from system engineering's point of view, so, so we, we, we need to have constraints so that we can actually uh, analyze the system. What do you think? Yeah, I think that it's, um, there's a way to combine these two things, right? So the problem with um, imposing, so, so what you can do if you take the machine learning view, so well, we're going to add more information to let's say our objective function, right? Um, and then you would need a lot of, uh, data to kind of explore the complexity of your, like your, the, the new thing you're trying to, to, to target, to track. But instead, what you can actually do is say, well, I'm not going to create a, let's say, a complexer model, but I'm actually going to use the structure I know from engineering to bring it into the learning problem so that I can re actually reduce the amount of data I need to learn something meaningful. And so an example of this is, is what I explored during my PhD, um, where I uh, basically use systems engineering, or let's say uh, electrical engineering in this case. Uh, so I model systems and then I'm using machine learning to, um, to mimic very complex optimization problems with very simple models. And I'm able to, I was able to fully decentralize uh, complex optimal power flow problems, which are actually uh, impossible to run in, in real time uh, and, and let alone uh, decentralize them. So I think there's a, this is just one example of where if you combine the best of both worlds, you're able to, um, to do things very efficiently in this case. Uh, and you are able to learn to, to at least um, bring much more structure to the behavior of the eventual machine learning system um, of course it's still a machine learning system so you would still have to test how it behaves and where it doesn't actually follow um, the constraints of the you know in this case of the kind of system that you're trying to mimic right and you would still in a formal kind of system safety way you would still have to kind of wrap around it some kind of fill safe mechanisms or at like a very granular understanding of what the what the, the, the failure mechanisms are but you can already see that there is a lot of uh, synergy to be to be made, and um, yeah, I mean another example is safe learning. It's one of my colleagues from Berkeley, who's now at Princeton, uh, Jaime Fizak, and uh, and other colleagues who've been trying to kind of mash concepts from modeling, control theory, with with machine learning, and uh, this is a growing field. Yeah, I I, I agree. So I'm. Um... From what I know from the field is that um, um, right now we see a lot of uh, progress in terms of actually considering constraint uh, during learning, right? So, yeah. so which means that um, uh, 
as you said, so so we might learn with, with less data, or we might learn with a more robust system because because we now have have constraints. Um, but but still, I mean, even after we learn with constraints, as you said, so we, we are not sure about uh, how how good this um, learn system is, right? Even if we learn with constraints, but still we need to have some approach which we will you know, be able to analyze the system, no matter if, if how it learns. So then this comes down to the problem of still, I mean. These gigantic things, right? It's still we need to find out uh, a more guaranteed ways of analyzing analyzing it, and uh, I'm not sure about uh, right now. We have get or already have any good theory uh, behind it on how to actually do this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the problems is, of course, you still run into the curse of flexibility, right? So if your system is so let's let's take an example of like a computer vision system, very complex models. Um, there are currently efforts to label video data, right? And there's so many questions there on like what should you label? Let's say pedestrian, should you label it if it's a small child? Should you label it differently, or should it just be a human being? Should you label an old person differently? And then should you label whether it's walking backwards or forwards? Like how fast it's going? There's so many of these questions actually that yeah. my, 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 in my perspective is I think we're, we're trying to build such complex things that are just, una we're un we will be unable to fully kind of agree with each other and yeah. fully yeah. <laughs> create it. And, and sometimes we have to take a step back and say, hey, you know, uh, maybe we need simpler systems. Maybe we need to kind of say, hey, certain types of technologies are, are, are not meant to serve certain kinds of functionalities just because they're inherently uh, uh, brittle, right? So that's uh, this gonna be a debate, right? I'm not saying you shouldn't use vision for, for autom aut autonomous vehicles, but I think there are just many small like uh, questions that turn out to be very political and very I think, controversial questions if we're not careful about them. Yes, I think so. Yeah. So shall we take some questions from Probably Ben, you, you you raise your hands first. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I have a question for Joel. Also, uh, feel free to cut me off if you want to focus on on the talks that have just happened. Um, but I'd just like to hear very quickly your view on uh, current progress in governing AI systems. I mean, there's a lot going on with EU AI Act at the moment and that sort of thing, and. Are you overall like optimistic about whether that's on the right track in terms of what you were talking about earlier, or do you think there's still like a, a big change that needs to happen in that sort of area? Um, well, let's take the, uh, the EU activity. Um, there we see that I'm, I'm optimistic that there is a debate going on and that politicians and policymakers are taking the emerging emergent risks of AI systems serious. But the way that that's then being put in, in shape is uh, still is very worrying. So the EU is the EU proposal, current proposal for the AI Act is leaning very heavily on product safety. So product safety is really about like whether this cable, like how thick this cable should be for it to be safe. Uh, it's very like tied to a particular kind of physical entities most of the time. Whereas, um, so I think, you know, my, my work on system safety over the last years has partly been a response to this product orientation. So I think we need to, uh, the, the policymakers need to kind of be very careful with not thinking that they can solve a lot of these more systemic emergent uh, risks with, with, with uh, product safety standards. So that's one one big concern I have. Um, and the other one is, I think, has to do with whether you can really come up with general standards like that. Of course, cable, cables are, are used everywhere. So like we can kind of come up with standards for cables, you know, in terms of their, their safety in a more general way. Uh, but when it comes to AI systems, uh, I think what we probably will see, or hopefully what we will see is that different domains will start to interpret kind of these emerging standards and say to what see to what extent these are, are really applicable to capture the, the actual risks in particular domains. 
Um, so the other concern there is that we will just have two general standards that will be more of a checkbox and not really address the, the risks that are more kind of contextual situated. Um, and then with the GDPR, we actually saw a different thing. In the, in the beginning, there was a push for privacy regulation. Th that didn't work out. Then actually different domains started to have their own concerns. And then eventually they came together again. And then that's the GDPR came, came about. It's not perfect, but you also saw this kind of dynamic of like different domains and sectors having to wrestle with their own complexities before understanding what kind of regulation they needed what kind of governance they needed. Great, thank you. And thanks for the talk earlier as well. Thank you, Ben. Michael? Yes, I have also uh, a question regarding the keynote. So you mentioned that, yeah, this, uh, this tech, ethics and policy as some, as some silos in your presentation. So, so my perspective is that at least at the EU, EU level, there is, there is a, a, a close interaction. We see a lot of things that are discussed in the HELA group in the, in the policy proposal for the AI Act. So from, from, from my experience, at least, but I, I want to have your opinion on this, it's more a gap between uh, technology related topics like the people that working heavily with AI and the people that coming from the traditional safety engineering. And therefore, I also consider this kind of, of workshops very important because there are totally different thinkings in these communities. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. I think the, 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 the silos were, um... I mean, at the EU level, there's definitely a very careful thinking about, okay, what kind of expertise should we bring together? Um, and, you know, at that level, I think there are meaningful conversations, but it's hard to translate them to actually like situated particular domains, right? As, as I just discussed. Um, but the, the siloing is very clear when you go, for instance, when you go into cities, so I work with sit different cities, and they, you can just see within the organizations how the policymakers are coming up with these instruments like an algorithm register where you try to kind of open source algorithms and they don't really understand that it's a system is much more than an algorithm, right? It's also like how it's embodied in a, in a machine or how it's interpreted. So you can see that these policy instruments, they have, they come from good intentions, but they're, they're, they're very, um, uh, they're just a small abstraction or kind of a narrow interpretation of, of the system. So this is also one of the ways that I see this, like this policy gap or this kind of the siloing between technology development and the policymakers at more of a local level. Uh, and and then to the other part of your 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 question, yes, I totally agree that uh, the the way the ways of thinking in this computer science disciplines of machine learning, algorithm, uh, algorithmics, and those in systems engineering are still, I think overall very like, there's a, there's a big gap there. And I, I'm not always so optimistic of like how interested different sides are to, to engage more with each other. So uh, there's a lot of work to do there. And I, I yeah, also hope that this place, this workshop and other initiatives can, can really encourage and also honor the people that are doing this work. Uh, I'm trying to kind of build bridges myself. I'm more of the granular. I hope to start doing more of the granular work in the coming years, but I know there are many people already doing that as well. So it would be great to feature them in, uh, uh, in places like this. And, um, and maybe also to, to see how more funding can come about to, to build this community. Thank you for your answer. Do we have any other questions for the audience? Okay, so I probably have, have one for the, uh, for, for the presentations. Well, I mean, so I, I see quite a few presentations talk about um, using some simpler systems basically to approximate the, the, the learning system, right? And then try to find the balance, for example, uh, I see one presentation talk about a few different goals and uh, how, how are we able to achieve goals 
And then uh, when you are achieving one goal, probably you can compromise the other goals, right? So my, my, my question was, I mean, of course we, we like to see, I mean, in terms of um, analysis, right? We, we, we want to see some models which we can analyze and uh, we can probably find um, a, a good guarantees about our analysis results. Um, but then um, the problem is that uh, still how to balance it, right? So, so I mean, uh, from engineering's point of view, we need to set up, for example, some criteria or some more quantitative ways of measuring how good now it is the simpler system. Right? So, so do we have any any theory in terms of uh, saying, okay, so when I when when I build a, for, um, a random forest for for this learning system. So, I mean, uh, is this random forest good enough to replicate the original system so that we just focus on this, this random forest? Or we are just randomly train a, a, a random forest and just forget about the original system. And then when we are, when we are analyzing this random forest, then we, we are not sure about if this analyzed results will be actually uh, good or not, correct or not, in terms of uh, uh, the original system. I mean, are we able, I mean, the, the, the general question is, can we set up, for example, some sort of um, criteria or it's better to be a quantitative way of actually uh, measuring a simpler system regarding to the original big system? Do we have anyone who actually has a good idea about this? So maybe I, I'll just give a try in a way of- uh, Yeah, thanks. To, uh, I, not in a way of, uh, if I understood properly. So uh, the more thing is, is there a metric to to say that the system is doing what it's doing uh, in, in that more in that condition, right? Uh, is it uh, that? So well, one thing which I look into it is, you know, why we are doing machine learning is, you know, if we could do this in uh, what do you call it, uh, procedural way of software development you know we could have done it and we could have tested it no and we could have written a test case for it for that okay this is what i want to do and this is what I, but in comes to learning systems we are only doing it because you know we couldn't write the, the procedural way and it is something like there is a concept in this data just learn from it and i think this is a very bigger problem than uh, uh, like we underestimate, so we see results that it is working, but from the uh, from the perspective of you know quantifying it, uh, or certifying it, it's a very huge problem uh, kind of thing. So we see that it is working, but to claim that it is working is a, uh, I think, uh, way because it, let's say the yesterday's discussion is all about that we cannot even write requirements for it, right? So what exactly do we want to uh, test or verify is. First, you have to write the requirements properly in that. So it's not even sure of what exactly we want to do. Like we we know some part of it, but we don't know the, the whole complete requirements for what we want. Because it's at concept level that like this is a car we want to learn. But what is a car is a, is a, is a bigger concept than that. Maybe I'm I'm just brushing <laughs> this what you are thinking, but my, my thoughts, my two cents to it, uh, not an answer, just a discussion. Anyone want to chip in or anyone have a new question? Um, so uh, maybe I can go ahead and for this for Pascal uh, in terms of, uh, since we are both more related. So I, I yeah. do more of an active uncertainty and he's the, the passive, uh, the external one. So uh, is there any forward uh, research on combining active and uh, so the internal and external uncertainties? If uh, Pascal or Michael. Is Pascal still around? Um, sorry. So I think, um, to be honest, I think Michael is more an expert in this topic because he is more <laughs> was mainly involved in um, working on this uncertainty wrapper. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if Michael is there right now. Is Michael up to answer this question? Yes, uh, yes, I'm here. Um, yeah. Um, I think uh, for me, it's a little bit difficult to, to give a good answer for this. Uh, yeah. Honestly, I, yeah, it's, I would say it depends and um, yeah. 
I, I, I clearly also, also see that this perspective of, yeah, um, to come back also to the, to the keynote uh, where there are some, let's say, um, yeah, um, some key learnings also presented, for example, not to heavily rely on probabilistic, but more on a systemic view. I think in the end, we need both. And I think um, the safety community have to go a little bit in direction of AI to, to also consider probabilities. But uh, because we, we, yeah, we have this, this simple problem that we have no complete requirement specification, but a requirements specification by example. And if we would have could get a better requirement specification, then we would not use machine learning for it. Yeah. And on the, on, the, on the other hand, um, we, we have to accept from a data science perspective that maybe we need more than just giving, let's say, some, some probabilities uh, based on some data, uh, but we, we need to argue why we assume that the, the yeah, let's say the estimates or the, the guarantees we give on our models are justified by how we how we come up with this with this estimates. Uh, this is yeah, not, now I know it's a very general answer to this no, no, question. Uh, true, true. You know, so true. You know, also from the keynote, I, it's all about you know getting the probability to a decision, and that is obviously in a larger system or in an autonomous system, or in with respect to a human, it is important that all these probabilities get. Uh, you what you call squash to a decision, right? So uh, let's see yeah, how we can combine those. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you all for uh, for the discussion. So I think we we are, we, we are now need to hand back to Cynthia for the post presentations. But I, I, yeah. I hope you guys can stay in uh, in a, in a coffee break so that we can we can still have more conversations. Thank you.